All right, let's get started. Welcome. So it's really my pleasure to welcome Don Bell to the first in uh, the first talk in our Global Environment Speaker Series this year. So the, this speaker series is sponsored by um, the Arts and Sciences, the Department of Geography and the Environment, Environmental Studies, and International Studies to bring in speakers of renown to talk to us about environmental issues of global importance. And Don certainly fits the bill in that regard. He's been a, a writer and editor for National Geographic for longer than I think most people in this room have been alive. Um, and Sadly. <laughs> Distinguishedly, um, and he brings a distinct um, voice to these issues, covering things. I think he edited the first um, coverage of kind of issue on Islam for the for National Geographic. He um, writes about digital media, and, and he um, covers uh, um, uh, 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 a number of different stories about the geopolitics of water. He actually has an issue, I think, in this month's issue of National Geographic on Sweden, right? Right. Um, and I should mention, actually, that today's, uh, um, so the geopolitics of water and the water stories are some of the things that he's going to share with us today. And I should also mention that this specific talk within the Global Environmental Speaker Series is also co-sponsored by the Department of Journalism, where Don will be teaching a special topics course in the spring on the Walk Out of Eden project. And I think you're going to talk a little bit about that near the end, latter part of your, your talk as well. Um, and that course will, in addition to the, um, being a journalism course, is also, will also be cross-listed by many of those departments and programs I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so environmental studies, international studies, geography. So uh, look for that uh, in the spring. So it's really my pleasure to welcome Don to Richmond, the University of Richmond, and the Global Environmental Speaker Series. Thanks a lot for doing this. We appreciate it. Thank you, Don. <laughs> I think I'm going to start with your permission by taking off my coat. It's a little hotter in here than I thought it was going to be. Um, uh, thank you, Todd. Thank you to all the departments that are involved in sponsoring this, the, the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies, international relations, of course, the journalism department, uh, where I'm going to be teaching a course in the spring on the Out of Eden Walk, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the, my association here at, at University of Richmond has actually been incredibly positive and productive so far. I've only been in Richmond a short while. I actually came down to teach at, at VCU. I taught a course in the journalism program at VCU mainly because my son was a senior there in the, uh, the arts program, and I wanted to spend more time with him, and they, they offered me a chance to, to teach, which I would always wanted to do. So I came down to VCU and actually uh, kind of used that experience as a way to test out some of the teaching methodologies for the project I'm going to be talking about later. Um, and then when I made connection here with Robert Odierne, the, the uh, chair of the Department of Journalism, and with Mary Finley Brook of the Department of Environment, you've got Geography, like three different. Studies, international yeah, studies. Uh, Mary's. It was wonderful because both Robert and Mary's eyes lit up when they heard about this project that I'm working on, and I think that you know we're. It's really got an extraordinary amount of potential to um, to apply to different disciplines, not just journalism per se. My friend is walking around the world as a journalist, but there are so many applications to mapping and geography and international studies, religion, anthropology. I mean, there's a lot of spillover, a lot of potential for collaboration. And so um, I'll, I'm excited to tell you about that. And the, cor like the course I'm going to be teaching in the spring is going to be open, as I understand it, to students from other departments as well, not just journalism. So it would be great to have a number of people from different disciplines um, in that class just to see what uh, could be made from that project in different ways, in different disciplines. I'm really excited about that. Um, as Todd said, I've been working for National Geographic for a long, long time. I've probably about 30 years. I started as a freelance working for the magazine back in 1981. Uh, did a story about the Chattooga River down in Georgia where the movie Deliverance was filmed. 
Uh, my uh, professor at the University of South Carolina was James Dickey, who was the poet in residence, but he had authored this book, Deliverance. It was a novel. It was later made into a movie starring Burt Reynolds. Uh, it was a popular movie. All these people started pouring in to go down the, the Deliverance River, just like Burt Reynolds did. Uh, so suddenly it had gone, from, it went from being a backwater, a, a little known corner of Appalachia, to being inundated with hundreds of thousands of college students who came in to get drunk, get in a canoe or a raft, go down the rapids, um, and uh, pretend they were Burt Reynolds. Who's, who, you probably don't know who Burt Reynolds is. <laughs> I'm totally dating myself. Um, anyway, a uh, big star of the day. Uh, and it was a really interesting sort of culture clash between these, between maybe 17th century uh, Ireland or, or Scotland and the Scotch-Irish pioneers and the Appalachians and the you know, modern college students coming in. And it turned out to be a really tasty little story. I, and I did that for National Geographic. Uh, it was published in 1983 as a freelance project. Then I went on staff in 85. I just kind of hung around, hung around, and finally wound up doing, um, you know, being the expeditions editor for a while and then the foreign editor for about 10 years. Um, at Geographic, in those days, editors also got out a lot. Um, uh, escaped the building and went out and reported on stories. And so I, I, you know, over the course of my career, I've done probably 25 to 30 stories uh, out in the world, many of them foreign stories um, about cultures and geopolitics in places like uh, India, South Asia, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, um, the Arab world. I've spent a lot of time in the Arab world over the years. I've done some stories in Europe and Latin America too. Um, but anyway, that, it's, it's given me kind of a, um, an interesting cross-section or an interesting look at the trends in our world uh, from various parts of the world. As far flung as the Baja California Peninsula in Mexico to eastern Siberia where I, was, I spent a summer at Lake Baikal uh, as the Soviet Union was falling apart in 1990, uh, traveling around with a bunch of Russian ship, sailors on a ship for three months. So I've had an incredible, incredibly blessed career, you know, and, and gotten to know people in situations all over the world. And I, I feel like in certain ways, I've, I've always looked for themes when I talk, you know, the, the things that sort of the thread that runs through a lot of these things. And a few years ago, I was doing a talk um, and realized that water issues and water actually does run through much of what my work has been for the last 30 years. Uh, practically every story I've ever done involves an environmental component and water and water resources and drought and <coughs> climate and things like that have always influenced the geopolitics or the cultural story that I'm there to, to uh, write about. And so it's, you know, it, it gave me kind of a new appreciation for the role of water in human uh, life and in human politics. Um, I'm just going to kind of roll quickly through a little bit of my my story here. Won't take long. Uh, I'm going to talk first about water stories uh, that I have done for National Geographic over the, over the years. Uh, this is a mural that came from Gaza. Uh, there's a project in Gaza in the Gaza Strip where. Um, uh, an NGO uh, does water murals about the importance of water, and of course, right now Gaza is is under a terrible shortage of water. I mean, it is it is a crisis right now in Gaza, and then much of the Middle East. I mean, a lot of what we're seeing in Syria and and across that part of the world has been driven by a drought that has been going on for four or five years now. When you get to Gaza, of course, there's a political overlay. There's there's war and all kinds of uh, other circumstances that make it worse, but uh, anyway, there's a huge water shortage in Gaza right now. And I just, but I, but this mural project has always been sort of close to my heart. I met them when I was in Gaza a few years ago. <coughs> uh, my appreciation for the world outside the United States, and I guess a little bit that my appreciation for the importance of water, was born in the spring of 1973 when me and some friends of mine that had gone down rivers in South Carolina, where, where I grew up set out to go down through Mexico and Central America on this long sort of camping expedition. We were gone for about three months. 
Uh, it was my first trip outside the United States. It was, I think everybody, this was really their first experience of international travel. Only one of us, the guy with the beard there on the right, he was the only one who spoke Spanish, and he high school Spanish. And so we're just blundering our way basically down through Mexico, Central America, just for the heck of it, just to see, experience life outside the United States and hopefully get a little bit of a education in what, how the rest of the world lives. And so our route, this is, the, the kind of car we had was this white vehicle, it was an international travel law. And we set out from uh, Columbia, South Carolina, where I'm from, and we drove down, 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 got, had all kinds of crazy adventures, won't even start to tell you about all that. But, but we, we finally got all the way down to uh, like Panama and our car, our, our uh, blessed car went belly up and so uh, the one, another guy and I hitchhiked home. And then that took, that was another little saga because it took us six weeks to hitchhike from Panama back to South Carolina. Uh, but Lordy, I mean that was, that was a, an education in and of itself because we were traveling, we didn't have any money, we were just you know, uh, begging campsites. So, I mean, we'd pull over and camp someplace on the side of the road for the night until the farmer found out, came out and kicked us out, and then we'd go down the road. It was just one thing after another like that. Every day was an adventure. Um, and we, but we started to develop an appreciation for how people in other parts of the world live. Um, it was interesting. I mean, one of the things that I remember from that trip was on our way south, as we were headed down through Texas, we went to Houston and San Antonio and then down to Laredo, Texas, where we were gonna cross the border into Mexico. And when we got to Laredo, Texas, it, it looked like, you know, it, it was like a third world hellhole to our eyes, to our innocent eyes. And when we got to Laredo, it kind of looked like that. In March 1973, Laredo, Texas looked like this desert uh, wasteland, you know, with rusted automobiles and mangy dogs running around and people living in dire poverty. After three months bopping around Mexico, Central America, camping out, having all these crazy adventures, getting in and out of tight spots and hitchhiking back, Laredo, Texas looked like that. In June 1973, Laredo, Texas looked like, you know, a vision of Shangri-La or something. It was a difference in my perception between on the way down when everything looked dry and destitute and on the way back up having experienced the poverty and the destitution and the, and the drought south of the border, suddenly I, I came to a new appreciation for what we have in this country. Laredo is part of Texas, it's part of the United States. I looked around, it was green, all I could see were campsites, potential campsites. So it was amazing, you know, the, the way travel, I, I'm sure a lot of you guys have traveled, but travel can really open up your heart and your eyes and your consciousness in lots of ways. And that was, that was really the beginning for me of that whole process. And I kept a journal. My uh, professor, James Dickey, had assigned me to keep a journal, and so I did that. And it was really the first inkling I had of what I wanted to do for a living. Um, because in a lot of ways, it's still basically what I do when I go on assignment. I, I you know, carry a notebook and a journal and I go off and I wander around and I get lost and I have all these kind of adventures and I try to factor it, you know, I try to analyze it so that I can glean realities from it about the culture that I'm experiencing and then I sit around my campfire at night or wherever I happen to be and, and write in my journal or, and then come home and write a story about it and hopefully share it with other people. Um, in 1981, or 1989, I did a story on Baja, California, in Mexico, and so I got to go back and kind of experience that life in the desert. You know, Baja gets like four inches of rain a year, it's a, it's a real profound desert, and life is tough down there, and it was amazing the way in which Baja in Mexico, which was trying to turn Baja California into a tourist mecca. You know, they had Cabo San Lucas and Los Cabos and these places down in the far south of the peninsula that they were trying to attract droves of tourists down there, but they didn't have the water to supply to all those toilets flushing and all the, all the water that, that uh, Californians use when they go on, on vacation. They didn't have those resources, and so they were digging deep wells and pulling out water out of their aquifers and fossil water out of the aquifers, and they were getting tainted with salt water, and so it was a huge issue 
you know, the water resource, the, the use of water resources in this very scarce water environment of Baja California. Uh, this is this is these two uh, adults here and the little kid are uh, members of the last indigenous uh, tribe, Indian tribe in northern Baja California, the, the Pai Pai Indian, which was you know when the when the missionaries came in in the 1700s, all these uh, tribes, all the Indians in Baja California were wiped out by diseases, and but there's this little remnant band in far northern Baja, and so I hung around with them for a while. Uh, I mentioned Lake Baikal earlier. Lake Baikal, just so you know, is the, the world's largest, deepest, most voluminous lake. It's got more water in it, more fresh water than all the Great Lakes combined. Uh, it's an amazing place. It's way out. It's near Mongolia, you know, far eastern Siberia, like nine time zones east of Moscow. And, and I had the, the privilege of spending a summer there uh, on a boat on a Russian research vessel traveling around the shores of Lake Baikal and, and trying to understand the, the position of that lake in the, in the ecosystem of Russia, not just in the, the physical ecosystem, but in the spiritual ecosystem as well. The, the Russians re regard Lake Baikal almost like we think of the Grand Canyon or something. It's, it's like an icon. It's like a symbol of everything that's great about Mother Russia. It's pristine. It's beautiful. Most people long to go there, even though their lives may not take them there. Or, you know, they all want to. They aspire to go to Lake Baikal and see it and drink its pure water. And back in the communist days in 1957, Khrushchev decided to put a cellulose plant on the shores of Lake Baikal, and the first factory to go on the shores of the lake. And he did it to fight the Cold War. The, the waters were pure. The, the mythology was it made really good aircraft tires for fighter jets so that they could compete with the United States. Um, and so they needed the pure waters of Lake Baikal combined with the cellulose from Siberian pines to make super cellulose for aircraft tires. And so they put this thing on the, this monster on the shores of the lake and it ignited in 1957 an environmental movement so in that local area, the writers and the scientists and environmental scientists and were up in arms about about taming Lake Baikal with this factory, and that the beginnings of that in 1957, when people didn't fight back in the Soviet Union, later, I mean, it, it just lingered there like like glowing in the dark for all those decades until the Green Movement was really a precursor in the 1980s to the opposition <coughs> movement, which later kind of flipped the whole communist system on its head. But it all got its start on the shores of Lake Baikal. Uh, this is a dear friend of mine who passed away a few years ago, but he and I are rescuing a freshwater seal from the, the pure waters of Lake Baikal. Um, later in my career, a few years later, I started working in the Middle East. I, uh, I did a story on Lawrence of Arabia, I did a story on Israel and the Galilee region. Uh, story on Syria. I, I, I started to really get interested in the Middle East and spent a lot of time there. And it was great because uh, at that point I was in, a, in a, my life, I could take my kids with me. My wife at the time was a National Geographic photographer, and so we would haul our poor kids with us wherever we went. And so this is in southern Jordan around Petra, where we spent uh, two years in a row, actually. We spent like three months in the spring two years in a row and we just embedded ourselves basically in the lives of the Bedouin. I was doing a story about Lawrence of Arabia, uh, which was set in that part of Jordan, and then again uh, the following year we came back and did Petra, and the kids just loved it. They had a blast. That's my daughter Lily on my left and my son Charlie, the, the guy who just graduated from BCU on the right, with two of our dear Bedouin friends. Um, one of the things I noticed about Petra, of course, Jordan is, is, is like Baja California. It's, it's a desert. It gets hardly any rain during the course of the year. And yet, at Petra, as some of you guys who may study history know, the Nabataeans, this ancient uh, civilization that was started, arose about 600 BC, lasted until the Romans took them over in about 300. Um, but the Nabataeans rose to prominence at Petra by managing their water supply, their scarce water supply. They had, they were master <coughs> hydrologists. They would capture the rainwater, the little bit of rainwater that fell, and, and send it through channels like these. 
so this is a main entrance into Petra. And this little thing right here is like a little water canal so that the water that, that the rainwater that falls on those cliffs will drip down into that groove and then be delivered to a cistern and they can store it, they can preserve it, and then they can sell it to travelers coming up from Arabia with their frankincense caravans. They had to go through Petra to get to Gaza, to get to Jerusalem, to get up to, uh, to Lebanon, to Damascus. And so the Nabataeans got rich by creating basically a uh, hotel uh, spa area that was based on the water that they were able to capture like this. At the time, uh, the, the height of the Nabataean civilization, it was like 60,000 people living in a desert that, that ordinarily could, could not support more than a few thousand. Um, and it was because they learned how to manage their, water, their scarce water supply. Um, and now I'm just going to quickly run through, very quickly, because I don't want to be um, running too far over here, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, three stories that I've done recently that, that uh, where water resources and the geopolitics of those water resources are really uh, important. They're vital to the, to the story. The first one is the Jordan River, which many of you may know. Um, the reason we were doing, the National Geographic wanted to do the Jordan River was to look at conflict over water. You know, there's a lot of loose talk about water wars. You hear that, you know, scrolling across the bottom of the screen on CNN, water wars at 11. You know, uh, a lot of people are talking about water wars these days. And it's easy to, to uh, imagine that happening. You know, the scare, as, as the water becomes more scarce, as climate change uh, begins to the effects of climate change, reduce water supplies further, rivers, uh, groundwater even can, could conceivably become the, the, uh, um, the prize in a war over a body of water. And uh, it's interesting to take a look back through history. Uh, historians tell us that only once in our long, not so proud history as, as a species, to, at least in recorded history, has there actually been a war over a water course, which happened in 40 or 2500 BC during the time of the ancient Sumerians in, in Mesopotamia. It was between two city-states, Uma and Lagash, and it was over a, what I guess was basically the, the uh, channel of the Tigris River at the time. And they actually went to war over it. Um, in our day, you know, there have been hundreds of skirmishes of conflicts of water, some of them involving military, you know, gearing up to fight a war, uh, threats, counter threats, strikes, military strikes, never full-blown war, but just short sometimes. And of the 37 times that that, 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 that kind of military skirmish has broken out in the late 20th century, like from 1950 on, 33 of those times happened right here in, along the Jordan River. Um, as Israel and its Arab neighbors, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and the Palestinians to a degree, have fought over the scarce water resources in the Jordan River. Uh, this is, this uh, photograph here is of Mount Hermon, which sits uh, at the, at the, up the north, uh, northernmost uh, corner of Israel, where Jordan, Lebanon, and Israel come together. The Golan Heights also is there, which is a contested area. But the, the snow melt from, the, from Mount Hermon is what starts the Jordan River on its way down. The headwaters of the, of the Jordan have been fought over for a long time between the various actors. Um, I'll show you a little. This is Mount Hermon is like right here. And here the, the Jordan River flows down through the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea where it ends. A couple of hundred miles. Um, it's basically a small stream. It's, you know, we have, if you haven't seen it, the Jordan River may, at least in my mind, before I actually saw it, was, was a sizable, majestic sort of a river because, you know, I was raised on the Bible and people getting baptized in the, in the Jordan River. In reality, it's maybe from here to Todd, you know, much of its length. Um, it's also highly polluted. Uh, Israel uses it for irrigation north of the Sea of Galilee, south of the Sea of Galilee. Everybody, Israel, Jordan, all the settlements, um, 
dump their saline water and their sewage and their waste water into the Jordan River. And so south of the Sea of Galilee, it is the, one of the most polluted bodies of water on Earth. Uh, the Sea of Galilee, however, is, is basically really clean fresh water because that's what Israel depends on for its water supply, and they manage it very carefully. But the Jordan River itself is contested every step of the way. Uh, further south, this is down uh, along the west, down near Jericho. Uh, pilgrims uh, come, bo you know, come into Israel to be baptized in the Jordan River. I see some smiles. Maybe some of you have actually done that. Um, there are, uh, but thousands and thousands of tourists come from all over the world to be baptized in the Jordan River. And these are, this is a group of, I think these are Romanians, uh, a group of pilgrims from Romania who were thrashing around in the water after being baptized. And I was with some scientists, some environmental scientists who had been measuring the pollutants and trying to find some sign of life in that water, any kind of little amoeba or any kind of little crustacean. They were desperately trying to find something alive in that water, but all they were, all they were getting was background pollution, uh, heavy metals, the saline, you know, it was highly 15,000 times more saline than the surrounding um, aquifers, et cetera. And so, you know, the people that I was with, these scientists were saying, oh my God, these people better go straight to the hospital. <laughs> after, after, you know, kind of dunking in the, in the, um, the Jordan River there. <clears throat> this is Amman, Jordan, a rooftop in Amman, Jordan. I was talking earlier about the severe drought that's underway uh, right now in the Middle East, and Jordan gets its water from the Yarmouk, which is a tributary of the Jordan, and, uh, and its ability to manage its relationship with Israel is critical in that. Uh, even so, Jordan, uh, when I was last in Amman, they were rationing water two days a week. They got water delivered uh, two days a week, they filled the tank on the roof, and then that had to last for the rest of the week. So water shortages in this part of the world are, are an ongoing thing. It's, a, it's reality. It's, it's the new normal. Um, in the West Bank, of course, there are all kinds of issues. I won't get into them right now because they're very complex and it takes a long time to explain it. But suffice it to say that Israel in the West Bank digs deep, deep wells, like 3,000 feet wells. The Mekarot, the, the state water carrier in Israel, digs deep wells in the, in the West Bank to pull up the aquifer water, the fossil water from underneath, whereas Palestinian farmers, like this fellow here, who's talking to a settler, uh, are prevented by Israel, by the military of Israel, from digging wells more than 300 feet deep. And to get a permit to even dig 300 takes a lot of effort. It's, it, can be, it can be a real ordeal to just try to get a permit to dig any kind of a well. And so Palestinians are mostly confined to using uh, spring water or, or water that falls, uh, the, the scarce rainwater that falls and that they're able to preserve or capture. And so this is an ongoing battle in the West Bank over these water resources, many of them underground. Um, uh, the Jordan River is also, you know, looking at conflict. Okay, we, we've been talking about a lot about conflict. I forgot to mention, the, the Six-Day War, the lead-up to the Six-Day War, one of the, the most severe precursors to the Six-Day War in 1967 between Israel and Lebanon and Jordan and Iraq and Egypt and Syria was uh, Syria tried to divert the headwaters of the Jordan. Uh, up here, remember where they start, they tried to build a, a diversion canal that, that went around the Golan Heights to Damascus. And when Israel found out about it, they were, they were doing all this at night under the carpet of darkness. The construction crews were working, but when Israel found that out, they bombed the, the construction crews from Syria, and that threw more uh, uh, fuel on the fire. Syria, tit for tat, shelled the national water carrier in Israel, which took water from this side of the Sea of Galilee and took it down the coast to Tel Aviv and the other cities in Israel. And so it was really that back and forth, that's what I was talking about, the skirmishing that goes on over water. It may not have been a full-blown war, but it certainly contributed to those hostilities that later became a war. Um, at the same time all that was going on, though, Jordan and Israel 
knew that it was really important for them to cooperate or share the water of the Jordan River. Uh, and they, you know, the, King Hussein was a young monarch at that point. Yitzhak Rabin, who was later the Prime Minister of Israel, was the Water Minister of Israel. And so those two gentlemen, in this kind of a spirit of cooperation, which is very rare, uh, met at a picnic table on the banks of the Yarmouk River every month to decide how much Israel would get and how much Jordan would get. And they would, it was very, it was all calibrated. I mean, they had their water ministries and stuff there, you know, with their little spreadsheets and stuff, figuring out, okay, we get this much water, you get this much water, and we will have peace. If you try to take more than that, there will be war. But that dialogue that started around the picnic table in the 1960s between Rabin and King Hussein later became the grounds for peace on a lot of different levels. They were able to cooperate over water, and that almost um, grew organically into a dialogue about lots of other issues. And so in 1994, when they finally signed a peace agreement, um, it was, it, it had all started at that picnic table with these two guys who wore disguises, by the way, um, to, to meet with each other, because their respective publics would have uh, disown them for doing that, um, but they met at that picnic table and decided about water. Uh, Bangladesh. I'm going to go quickly through this. Bangladesh is a is a sits in a delta of two of the major river systems in the world. Um, it start both of those rivers, the the Brahmaputra and the Ganges, start up in the Tibetan plateau. The the runoff from the Tibetan plateau, they come down and they meet in the delta around um, at the, the tip of the, or the top of the Bay of Bengal. It's Bangladesh and Dhaka, the capital is right there. Um, we were, I went there for National Geographic to report on adaptations to climate change because Bangladesh is, man, talk about being in the eye of the storm. Not only is sea level rising and the inundating um, tr crop fields that have been there for generations, as sea level rises, it, it puts Bangladesh underwater, basically. Uh, not only that, but, but much of Bangladesh is just a few feet above sea level. Their capital, which is like 15 million people, sits between six and eight feet above sea level. So if we get a sea level rise of three, six, nine feet, Dhaka, a city of 15 million, is going to be underwater. Um, However, they, I mean, the, there are mitigating factors, which is, or not mitigating, but it, there are adaptive, fact, uh, adaptive factors that you see in Bangladesh that you don't see in many other places. The Bangladeshis, to their credit, have learned to live with this crazy situation where they're, where they're cooking you know, lunch. I, I went to this house for lunch, and during the court, it, when, when we started lunch, that floor was dropped. The, the river came up. They're sitting there at the confluence of these two rivers. The river rose during lunch. They didn't bat an eye. I was like, is anybody else noticing this? <laughs> they continue to cook, man. They just, you know, went ahead uh, and cooked their meal. And at the end of, of lunch, they were like, geez, I guess we may have to move. And they started pulling their house down. That's the way, kind of the way they operate. They, they are very adaptive people. This is their life. This is their history. Um, they, you know, they have cultivated ways to, this is a canoe made of plant material that is like a floating garden. So you plant a, a garden on solid ground and the river rises and it gets flooded and killed. If you, if you plant your, your uh, crops or you plant your, your food on a floating canoe of plant material, then you can just paddle it away when the river rises. If, you, if your kids want to go to school, and of course the, the school would be flooded in these islands in midstream and these rivers. But you, if you put the school on a boat and you get an NGO to, uh, to fund a little computer uh, situation and some books, suddenly your, your kids can go to school in a, in a floating school. Uh, same thing with hospitals. There are NGOs that run floating hospitals that move around in the river, river delta serve people with, with medical care. And this is actually um, a mosque, <laughs> the, the, the roof of a mosque. I was, I, I was staying with some people on one of these islands that was starting to flood and, uh, and everybody knew kind of, okay, the, the river's coming up, 
They never know, for example, when the river is going to start to flood because India upstream of the Ganges releases water without notifying the Bangladeshis. So all of a sudden, surprise, surprise, the water starts to rise and they go, oh heck, I guess we're going to have to tear down our mosque or, or take it apart. They, they put it together with string and, and reeds and stuff and they just pull a string basically and it collapses and then they pack it into boats and they take it off to the next island and then they rebuild it. And so this is, you know, the, the water started to rise about five o'clock in the afternoon and by noon the next day, these folks had torn down their mosque, packaged it up, put it on boats, moved it to a new island, and restarted it. And so it was ready for afternoon prayers. Um, this is a guy that I befriended when I was in Bangladesh, one of these characters who lives on islands and just moves constantly. I asked him, uh, how many times have you moved in your life? And he, you know, he's like, I don't know, 60, 100, who cares? That's his whole life. That's his lifestyle. He has moved probably hundreds of times in his lifetime. Uh, whenever those rivers go up, they, they pile into boats. Uh, there's a very intricate system of who gets first dibs on, on dry ground, all those kinds of things. But the Bangladeshis are extraordinary at adapting to climate change in lots of ways. And so that was a really interesting, uh, kind of an insight into their culture and into their, their um, society. And then uh, I did a story a couple of years ago on the, the marshlands of Iraq, uh, and the people called the Marsh Arabs. Um, this is, this is the, what we call Mesopotamia in the old days, uh, where the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers come together. Again, this is a real lowland here. The rivers, uh, those two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, start up in the mountains of Turkey, eastern Turkey, and then they flow down. They come together right north of Basra, and they flow into the Persian Gulf. Um, the, this is where civilization arose, the historic historians tell us. This is the place where the Sumerians took root in these city-states of Sumeria. Uh, 4500 BC, you know, the, the Sumerians were a thriving civilization based on agriculture in those marshes. That's what the marshes basically looked like from 4500 BC to about 1990 AD, at which point Saddam Hussein declared war on the Marsh Arabs after the first Gulf War and, and uh, drained them, uh, turned them into a desert. And so hundreds of thousands of people dispersed all over Iraq. Uh, many of them were killed. You know, he sent his army in to bomb villages and things like that. And, and there was a, a war basically on the Marsh Arabs in southern Iraq, who also happened to be Shiite. Um, after Saddam Hussein fell in 2003, one of the things that happened was all these Marsh Arabs who had been just kind of living, wandering, uh, destitute people roaming Iraq trying to find a place to live all those years. Between 1990 and 2003, a lot of them came back and started uh, living the, the lifestyle that their forebears, their ancient forebears had, had lived. And so I spent about a month living in these marsh Arab houses out in the marshes to see what life looked like when, when it started to come back there. Um, as the marshes reflooded, people started to fish again in traditional ways. This is just a, an old tiny fish hook. Maybe the Sumerians were using fish hooks just like this, but this was a fish gig that was being used. They harvest reeds from the marshes. They sell them to, to uh, farmers for cattle fodder. <clears throat> these are the typical houses that you see in the marshes. The, these uh, uh, just reed sort of conic or uh, half moon shaped houses made of reeds. It's just a little marsh girl. You know, I mean, a lot of these people sort of roam around like they do in Bangladesh. A lot of it's tribal, so if your tribe is out of favor, uh, you have to move someplace else. If your tribe is powerful, then you can stay for a while. Um, these, I, I lived on a, with a Marsh Arab family for about two weeks on a floating mat of reeds. Their house is on a floating mat of reeds, and they had water buffalo. That, that's, that's what we see here, the kids in the house. The buffalo are their most prized possession, really their only possession, and so they allow the, the cattle, the livestock, to come in and sleep with them under their roof, and so it's all kind of mixed up together. All the livestock, the water buffalo, the kids, you can imagine how unsanitary that situation is. 
especially since the surrounding area, which is, is flooded by the Euphrates, which is polluted from Baghdad and other cities upstream. And so it's a terrible environment you know, to try to raise kids w without getting sick. Um, and then this is one of their most prized possessions, which is a, which is a uh, plastic water jug that they get filled. Occasionally there are people that actually come out into the marshes and fill uh, from a tank these, these uh, water buckets. Um, but it was really an interesting um, insight into what way life has been lived there for a very, very long time. Water is integral to their way of life. If they don't have water, they're not going to be able to live there anymore. They're going to have to go disperse again, be, be, go into diaspora. And of course, these days, just to bring this story up to date, you know, I'm, there's a drought that has continued to to shrink the marshes. They, they rose after 2003, now they're shrinking again, back to about half their original size. Um, ISIS has captured the dam at Fallujah upstream on the Euphrates. Uh, there's, there's some um, concern that they'll capture the dam at Ramadi as well. So not only is Turkey building dams in eastern Turkey that will starve the Tigris and Euphrates of water, but also ISIS and all the geopolitics uh, between those two countries and among the different actors in, in Iraq directly affects their ability to live. <clears throat> water is a human right, damn right. This is uh, again from the, the Water Murals of Gaza project. Now I'm, I'm running out of time so I'm going to do this fairly quickly. But um, the course I'm going to be teaching in the spring is using this project called the Out of Eden Walk. Um, as a kind of a laboratory for learning about storytelling, learning about journalism, learning about all kinds of things. It's uh, a friend of mine named Paul Salopek. Maybe you guys have seen this. This was a cover story in National Geographic in December of 2013 that set out the idea, the big idea of the walk. Um, I've known Paul Salopek, the uh, journalist who's taking, setting off on this seven-year, 22,000-mile walk from Ethiopia to the southern tip of South America since he showed up in the Legends Department of National Geographic, and I was his editor for about 10 years. Um, I've, he, he and I have gone back a long time. He's, he's, he's a crazy person in lots of ways, and let me put, make that clear, but he's also one of the, the most skilled, highly skilled not cases he'll ever meet because he is a gifted writer. He is a gifted storyteller. And so when he sets off on his seven year trip around the world, he's not just doing it for his own benefit. He's not doing it to get in shape. He's not trying to set some sort of a record. He's not trying to get, get into the Guinness Book of World Records. What he's doing is he's recording what reality is like in 21st century planet Earth, basically. He is setting out in the pathways of earliest human migration out of Africa and around the world, you know, between the 150, maybe between 150 and 70 million, 70,000 years ago, our ancestors walked out of Africa, fanned out across the Middle East, one branch went to Europe, one branch kept going east across the Asia, across China, across the land bridge, came down the west coast of the Americas. And by the, about 11,000 years ago, we had reached the southern tip of South America. Paul is recreating that route from Ethiopia all the way to the tip of South America. And as he goes, he's creating a record of what he finds. Uh, he's a brilliant reporter and writer, and so National Geographic is publishing a lot of his work uh, as he goes along. This is a, kind of a generalized look at his route. Um, our partner up at Harvard's uh, Center for Geographic Analysis did sort of a generalized map based on where people may have gone. You know, there are theories about exactly what route we took as a species. And of course, there are branches. Europe, Indonesia, up into Siberia, across Central Asia, et cetera. But this is so, so this is sort of a generalized approximation of where our route was. <coughs> What Paul's carrying on his back, and, and he actually hires mules or, or uh, camels sometimes to carry his junk, but he's packed very light. But these are some of the tools that he uses to tell his stories. Uh, he's deeply connected. He's tweeting, he's doing social media, he's doing dispatches, he's writing constantly, he's uploading his stories to the back to National Geographic, he's taking video, he's taking sound files. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. 
Uh, this is Paul with one of his beasts of burden. He's a big fan of camels, as am I, and so um, Paul uses camels basically to carry his stuff. He doesn't ride anything, he walks. He's very conscientious about walking. I spent a couple of weeks walking across Jordan with Paul uh, a year and a half ago, and he was very, very scrupulous. You know, we would leave, the, leave his walking path. He walks along. Okay, we're going to go over there and look at something, and maybe we get in a truck and drive a couple of miles and go look at something, but he always wants to come back to exactly where he stopped and then continue on. He's like that. Um, he, you know, the, the integrity with which he's doing this walk is really quite admirable, I think. Um, he started, this is in Ethiopia, the middle Awash uh, River Valley in Ethiopia, where early, the, the earliest human encampment there in Ethiopia that's being studied by Dr. Tim White at the University of California, Berkeley, um, who is kind of the expert on that early man, the, that a rising of human of homo sapiens in that part of Ethiopia and then the movement out, possibly because of climate change. Uh, as Paul walks, he takes photographs. He works with a photographer, but he uh, also takes pictures. Uh, as um, he became aware as he's walking through the Ethiopia that we are living, he knows this anyway because he had done his research, but we're living through a time, maybe the, the largest period of mass migration in human history. Um, that's arguable. I'm not an expert. Maybe Mary has a thought on that. But there are, there are millions of people on the move right now. This is before the war in Syria really got started. And, you know, there are millions of refugees that have poured out of Syria just within the last year or last couple of years. Uh, Paul started in 2013, early 2013, and there was a mass migration of people out of Africa. Of Central Africa, uh, trying to get to the Red Sea, trying to get stowed away on a boat so they can go to Europe, go anywhere other than the Sahel where climate change is having a, an adverse effect on people's ability to, to raise cattle, to, to make a life for themselves. Uh, there's a huge migration underway. And these are just some things that these migrants leave behind as they reach the Red Sea. You know, they throw away things that they're not going to need for the next leg of their journey. <clears throat> these are some of these migrants who have reached the Red Sea and are sitting there trying to get a cell phone signal. You know, it, it really is kind of a telling thing that this is, this is a symbol of our modern world. Uh, but these are all guys who are just sitting there trying to, hopefully, you know, trying to get a signal on their cell phone. Uh, as Paul walks, he's, he started in Ethiopia, went up the west coast of Saudi Arabia, went through Jordan, went through Israel, the West Bank. Uh, Turkey, he walked along the border with Syria and encountered all these Syrian refugees that are pouring across the border into Turkey. Um, Geographic did a cover story on that, uh, that refugee um, wave that's destabilizing countries other than Syria now. Um, as Paul walks along, I mean, one of our basic features, one of our most important features is a map. Uh, we have a, a map interface and, and we're putting all kinds of assets on that map um, so that as, as we, as we, uh, as Paul walks along, we're creating uh, assets that you can go click on and learn about. Uh, those little uh, borders there are National Geographic stories that he's done, so all you do is click on that icon and you go to the geographic story that was done there. Um, but it's a very useful tool for us to use. So here, you know, the this is a National Geographic story that was done. You click on one of those icons, and it takes you to the, the National Geographic dispatch that Paul did about that. Um, also, it gives us a way to do stories within a story. So that they, Paul, when he was in Jerusalem, did, did a, uh, a feature, a, a map-based feature, where he went around, he walked around Jerusalem with a guide. Actually, they did a, like a coil. You see the, right here, they're sitting in a cafe trying to figure out how they're going to do Jerusalem. And that's essentially what they did. And then all those icons that you see on the map are either a photograph or a, or a dispatch or a video or some sort of an asset, some reporting that he did and logged onto the map. Uh, police stops. You know, as he walks along, as you can imagine, here's a, this uh, weird looking American tracing along with a camel and this gear, this 
electronic gear, very suspicious. And so as he walks, he's being stopped by the police constantly. Everywhere he's been, he's been stopped by the police. Um, just in Jordan alone, you know, these are all, as he was coming up Saudi Arabia, these were like arrests where he was hauled off to a, a station. These are all stops where he got stopped by the police. Uh, here's just an example. January 14, 2013, stopped and questioned by a Jordanian secret police in a battered Corolla. Agent hand copied my passport onto a paper, borrowed from Salafat. <laughs> so the the uh, the Mukhabarat, the secret police, you know, recorded his details on his passport from a piece of paper they borrowed from him. But it's as as Paul walks, these accumulate. He will have a record of every time he's stopped by the police until he gets to South America. Um, same thing with these pictures and these videos and these stories that he's writing. He's littering, he's leaving in his wake this record of what it means to be alive in the 21st century. Uh, every 100 miles he stops and he takes what he calls a milestone, which is he interviews the nearest human being, in this case the little girl. He asks three set questions, who are you, where did you come from, and where are you going? Three standard questions, and so these accumulate over the course of 22,000 miles. Uh, he takes a video of his ambient surroundings. Uh, he takes a picture of his feet to show the ground, the soil, etc. He takes a picture of the sky just as a register of what the weather's like. You know, he he records it on his GPS so he can put it on the map. He records temperature and, and other uh, weather sorts of data. And and as these accumulate, as Paul walks around the world, this was a this was a milestone that he did in Wadi Rum. This is Charlie, my son, and that's me on the, on the mule, because I got blisters on my feet from my boots were not fitting properly, and so I was riding at that point. Um, anyway, so Paul takes these milestones uh, every 100 miles. Um, these accumulate. He's now, I think he's up to 28 as he's gone. He's 2,800 miles. He's made 28 milestones. Um, these are the faces. You know, one of the things he does is he takes a picture of that person that he asks those three questions too. And so over the course of his first two years, these are the faces that he's encountered. Uh, as these accumulate, there will be 2,200 of these faces by the end of this adventure. And you can imagine the mosaic of humanity that that will be once, once this uh, project is over. And it's data, it's, it's human encounters that may be of interest to people who are doing research of some kind. At the very least, it connects us with people in other parts of the world that we never would have known otherwise. Uh, we got a grant from the Knight Foundation to translate Paul's dispatches for National Geographic into languages other than English. So I think we're now in nine or ten languages. That will continue. We're going to continue to build the number of languages that his uh, dispatches appear in. Uh, I was telling Mary that we were doing this Twitter spotlight um, where if you're as, as he's walking along, they imagine a hundred mile radius in the air above him, in the in the uh, Twitter sphere above Paul. What we're doing is we're partnering with a, a group called MENAN, again with a grant from the Knight Foundation, to sample what the Twitter sphere is saying in that fifty or hundred mile radius around Paul, and that we're translating them from their native language into English, so that people. <laughs> and other parts of the world can understand what's being said. You know, these, this particular Twitter uh, spotlight was done with, so we, we caught Hebrew, we caught Arabic, and it's, uh, there were some things about the, uh, the weather, you know, there was a, a drought underway, and so some of the tweets were about the weather, some of them were about Justin Bieber, this happened to coincide with something that Justin Bieber did and got arrested, and so people were tweeting about that in Arabic and in Hebrew. But it, it's, it's an insight. It gives us some insight into what people who are conversant with technology are tweeting about as Paul walks around the world. And so this will follow him as he goes around from Ethiopia to South America and we'll know what, what was going on in the Twitter sphere. <clears throat> um, education, of course, I'm going to run through this the rest of the way. Education is one of the main goals of this whole project. So as Paul goes around, he, he speaks at schools, he, he brings local classrooms, teachers uh, into the project. It's like inviting them to come around the campfire. Um, 
We, we have partners. We have uh, partners of the Project Zero at the Harvard Graduate School of Education with uh, the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Uh, the University of Richmond is going to be a little uh, seat for, for what is done educationally from here on. Um, and what we're trying to do is to expand the, the, the influence, expand the, the notion of what can be gained in the realm of education from this project. While he's walking, he's going to be walking probably for five more years. Um, this is a time when this is all happening right in front of us. One of these days, 50 years from now, 20 years from now, people will look back on this and maybe still be able to play with the data. But he's, he's out there now and is able to interact with classrooms. Um, you know, I mean, you send kids out from e either college students or elementary school kids or high school kids, send them out to map their neighborhood, to learn about their environment, to, to map their neighborhood to start to report on it, to become reporters, to, to raise their consciousness of, of what their world is really like. And then, of course, this is a, a picture, actually, of this campus. But uh, we have uh, really made an effort to take this. We have partners in, in secondary schools with the Pulitzer Center and with uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education. What's been missing <coughs> until now is a university component. To this. And so when I came to VCU and pioneered my class, it was really to start the ball rolling. And so coming to the University of Richmond and teaching this class in the spring is going to be a really important next step. Um, the other thing that I'm doing is, besides teaching it on a campus, is actually this is one of my students from VCU who, who was part of that class the first year I taught it. Um, these are the sorts of things that we will do in class. So, you know, this is a, a look at my <coughs> syllabus or my curriculum here. But you know, the, I send my students out to do social media, to, do, to capture any, to use all the tools at their disposal to tell the story of where they go. So my students will go out into the city. They'll, go, they'll find walks. They'll find stories in our environment, in our, in our city. Um, and use the tools of a journalist, the, the multimedia tools of a modern journalist, uh, to record that and to tell those stories, uh, whether it's Twitter or whether it's you know, posting things on the web or blogging or videotaping or whatever the new technologies are. Um, over the next five, 10 years, there may be a whole new set of tools for us to use. And Paul and, and we will be exploring those and, and finding new ways to still tell stories when in reality, this, and Robert knows this and Mike in the back, but they know that this is actually a very old thing. It's not a new thing to go out and learn deeply about your environment. That's what reporters have always done. That's, that's, the, that's job one. You know, you go out into your environment, you ask questions, you hang around, you get to know people, you, you build, you find stories. And if you slow down and practice what we're calling slow journalism, you're going to find stories everywhere you go. And that is a key skill for a journalist to have. No matter what your tools you're using to tell those stories, whether it's a video camera or a, or a tape recorder or a, a blog or a tweet or whatever it is, whatever tools you're using to tell that story, slowing down and paying close attention to your environment is a key thing. Asking questions, getting to know people. Uh, will interact with Salopak. He's in Tbilisi, Georgia right now, getting ready to set off across Kazakhstan, you know, in the wintertime. I, well, I, I talked to him the other night, and he's trying to figure out if, I mean, he can't find anybody that wants to walk with him across Kazakhstan in the winter, and I don't blame him. I mean, who wants to do that? <laughs> so, so anyway, so he's, he's, right now he's in Tbilisi, he's got an internet connection, we can actually interact with him. Uh, we can bring him into the classroom on a Google Plus, um, or Google Hangout or on Skype or something and actually interact with Paul. Um, I'm also, I also have a small grant from the uh, Pulitzer Center to teach workshops in the Out of Eden Walk at universities around the country. So, you know, based on the, the course that I'm teaching here at the University of Richmond, I'm going to be teaching workshops in using the walk at the university level in, in the Dill. At Northwestern University in Chicago next month. I'm going to be at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, probably either later this year or early next year. 
but we're we're trying to. I think there's an enormous potential for this walk to to be used in collaboration with other departments. It's also a great tool for journalists and journalism students. And so what we're doing is just trying to spread that spread that idea. I think what I'm going to do is just leave you with a little audio file, um, just to give you a sense of what Paul's voice sounds like, maybe, and kind of the way his mind works. Um, this is just him recording himself as he's walking along after partying with his with his uh, guides in Ethiopia as he's m moving now into Djibouti as he's crossing that border. Two miles from the about 17 or 18 miles across the desert plain that is the color of charcoal. Sorry, the voice, the audio is down. Covered with dark volcanic boulders, ranging in size from rolling bubbles to cars. This will be the last day that I've walked with my four complement of friends from Ethiopia. Of our pastoralists and camel drivers, Mohammed and Khaled will be heading back and returning home to their families to the banks of the Alwash River, close to where they started the walk about a month ago. I wonder what kind of stories they'll be taking with them and repeating through the years. Almost assuredly, it will be different from mine, as it should be. My stories fossilize the moment I put pen to paper. But in societies that are pre-literate, that tell the stories about who they are orally, the story changes all the time. Will it be as accurate as mine? Uh, who's to say, but odds are it will be truer because stories told verbally through the years, what Muhammad and Qadr will remember of these days will be like river stones, smoothed by the tongue, rounded by repetition, improved upon by memory that only a core truth remains that's important to the teller. Already, I think, in that sense, our paths have diverged. You know, one of the cool things about the walk to me is that it's very much in the tradition of ancient wandering bards and storytellers, you know, that go back to the beginning of human history, possibly. You know, I mean, the storytelling tradition began when uh, Ugg went off and had an encounter with a saber-toothed tiger and came back to the campfire and told everybody about it. And, you know, at first maybe he was using pantomime and stuff and not that, that. But that's, storytelling is what Part of what enabled us to survive as a species, our, our ability to communicate, to tell stories, it helped, it was a survival, it was a leg up on our competition. All these other homo uh, species that were populating didn't maybe have the same ability to tell stories and communicate that we did. And so in a certain way, Paul is recreating the experience of our earliest ancestors. He's telling his stories using the latest digital technology that we have at our disposal, which it really makes it kind of a historic thing. Um, anyway, I think that's it. I, I'm out of time, and I thank you for your attention. A really quick housekeeping item. For those in Dr. Finley Fork's class, there is a sheet that should be circulating if you, if you want to um, sign up. Um, I think we may have time for just one question. If uh, somebody has a quick question, um, they, they, they'd like to ask um, Don before he takes off. One or two. Take the pressure off. One, one or two. two. <laughs> <laughs> one right here. Yes. Uh, does anyone that 
Yeah, the question is whether I have a favorite place or, or a place that really stands out in my mind that I've ever been. You know, it's it, it's a little bit like children having kids. You know, which one's your favorite? Because every time I go to a place, I, I experience it. I try to experience it with a depth and um, kind of an open heart, so that I, I, it gets into my bloodstream. I mean, I had one of the best summers of my life at Lake Baikal in Siberia as the Soviet Union was falling apart, as there was no food to be had in stores. I mean, it was it was crazy. I mean, it was wild, but boy, was it interesting. I mean, I felt like I was watching history make in the making. You know, as the Soviet Union, as the wheels came off the Soviet Union and it didn't function anymore. Um, so it was it was amazing experience. Uh, every time I go to Jordan, you know that that experience of, of walking in the footsteps of Lawrence Arabia around southern Jordan and learning, going through Bedouin boot camp and learning how to camp and learning how to handle camels and all that kind of stuff. That just to kind of get a sense of what Lawrence lived through for, during the First World War. Um, that's that's such a precious memory to me. I mean, I, I've had. Pakistan was was again. It was a really dangerous and crazy place to be in lots of ways. But man, I, I think about it all the time. I, so I, you know, all those places I think are special to me in lots of ways, which is why I feel like I've lived such a. I'm so lucky to have lived the life that I have. Um, I'd go back to any of them in a heartbeat. I mean, when I'm there, I'm thinking, geez, I could really live in Pakistan. Geez, I could really live in Afghanistan. Geez, I could really live in Mexico. So it's it, it's a hard question to answer, but but it, the, these places stay with you, and the people. I mean, that's the whole thing: is the people you meet along the way. The geographic has always enabled me to stay long enough that I develop relationships with people. I come back and back, and we get to know each other, and I do stuff with them, meet their families, and all. And and so I have these friends all over the world. Now I can stay in touch with them on Facebook, you know. But I'm having conversations with people in Mongolia. And Russia and South America and all over the place because I'm, I'm rich in friends. Um, so it's, it's not a very good answer to your question, I guess. Yes? Is there any repetition? The repetition? The repetition. The Um, hmm, that's a that's a good question. Um, the Out of Eden Walk has a very light footprint. There has not been a lot of hubbub around the project, <laughs> and that's by design. Paul wants to, this to be very, very low key. He doesn't want to call a lot of attention to himself. He's very much a, a classical journalist, just wanting to sort of disappear into the story and hear what he hears. Very rare to get pictures of him. He doesn't want to be the story. He wants to tell the stories of other people that he encounters. And so he t tends to, to just make a very light impact wherever he goes. Um, there have been a couple of times when his presence became known and, and there was some hoopla around it. Um, as he walked through Saudi Arabia, he was in Saudi Arabia for six months. The Saudis do not give visas to people to walk through the Hejaz, Western Saudi Arabia, for six months. And so he had, we had to essentially move heaven and earth um, at, at the royal family level to get that visa approved. And then there was a lot of security guys who were watching him from a distance, you know, these police stops. You know, as he was walking, 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 there was a perimeter, you know, maybe of a mile on either side where there were security people who were keeping an eye on him because they didn't know what whether he was spying or he didn't know what. But he's a he's an infidel, he's Christian, and so he's walking through a very sensitive part of Saudi Arabia where Me Mecca and Medina are both in that part of Saudi Arabia. So there was probably a lot of um, impact in their security apparatus of Paul's walk. Um, locally, you know, when he comes to town, there have been times when his life was in danger as he was walking along those those uh, villages uh, in Turkey, southern Turkey, along the border with Syria. 
There were Kurdish villages that were afraid of being infiltrated by ISIS, and there had been a lot of kind of uh, media about Europeans who were converting to Islam, getting, you know, being indoctrinated by ISIS, and then trying to infiltrate their home governments. And so, as, as this white guy, without a, he, he explains what he's doing, and people go, yeah, right. You know, you're walking around the world. Sure, tell me something else. But, but so as he walked through a village in southern Turkey full of Kurds who were uh, very suspicious and very um, upset about the whole ISIS thing, they were, you know, they were, ISIS was making excursions across the border and killing people and kidnapping people and taking them back. And so when he showed up with his interpreter walking along with a mule, he was very suspicious, and, and the, the town turned out in the town square, and you know, it was a mob situation, and they were about to get their torn limb from limb when somebody bundled them into a pickup truck and drove them out of town. Um, so there, there are local ramifications, just depending on what the circumstances are. Most of the time, Paul is welcomed generously. People are hospitable pretty much everywhere he's gone so far. Uh, I don't. I don't think that'll ever change. Uh, every place I've ever been in the world, people are bent over backwards to make you feel welcome. If you're a stranger who's sort of thrown yourself on their mercy, um, but it's it's interesting. Governments have not have pretty much left him alone. Nobody really sees. There hasn't been. I take that back. Turkmenistan just denied his visa because they didn't like some of the things that he wrote about Israel as he was going through it. They didn't like some of the things he wrote about Saudi Arabia as he went through it, and so they saw him as a threat, his reporting as a threat. You know, I, I mean, Paul is very careful not to buy, uh, borrow trouble as he goes through these places, and so he's he's not really covering the the policy. He's not doing investigations and that sort of thing to get governments riled up. But even so, a government like Turkmenistan that's very closed, it's very uh, authoritarian looks at him and they go, why do we need this? Why do we want to put ourselves at risk from some reporter who's walking through our territory? So the answer is no, you're going to have to go across Kazakhstan in the way. Is that, a, does that sort of answer your question? Yes. We have one last question right here. Yes. The, the question is about this, what social impact Paul envisions or National Geographic envisions at the end of this project. That again is a really good question. I mean, as, at the very least, I think it's leaving a record for future generations, an extraordinary historic record of what our planet looked like, what humanity looked like in the early 21st century. Uh, so there's a legacy involved in that. I think as Paul walks along, he's hoping that the more people experience the walk, that enjoy learning about it, enjoy learning about other cultures through his experiences, that that will somehow bring people together. That, I mean, that's always been the mission of National Geographic in lots of ways, is to, is to hopefully connect people in, in parts of the world that we don't really understand or have not really had many dealings with. When you don't understand something, it's very easy to be fearful of it or suspicious of it or feel hostility towards it. What he's seeking to do, I think, is to create the, the re, or, or remind us that we are all human in this and that we speak lots of different languages, we tweet in different languages, we eat different things, we behave in certain local or different ways, but that there's a core of humanity that unites us all and that this is a shared journey. His journey as he walks around the world is something that we all can share in and take some inspiration from, maybe. That's, I think, what he would say, or something like what he would say. Great. Well, really fascinating the way you were able to tie together these themes of war, adaptation, and mass mi migration to water. So you can only imagine what's going to come out of this Out of Eden project and kind of that class. That I would encourage people to sign up for that class if they want to explore this topic further. And um, let's thank Donald for time.